recognize at one point that when you're trying to be just positive on your own, you fall short. So your positivity is only as good as you are. And if you fall short, well, then positivity will fall short. Mm -hmm. But if your positivity is rooted in a greater power and a greater strength beyond you, which in Jesus, yeah. that is true positivity. That is real optimism. Welcome to the Built to Last podcast, a community for coaches founded on the principles encourage, equip, and empower. We are performance coaches working for eternal purpose. Now, here are your co-hosts, Charlie Ray and Justin Bentevania. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Built to Last. We are honored to have you with us. Uh, we were also honored to have John Gordon on the show with us in this episode. Uh, I first met John back uh, over a year ago in Florida at an FCA Legacy Weekend, and it was an amazing experience getting to know him, hear him speak. Uh, we struck up a conversation, and from there, he actually came on the show, which you guys are about to hear. And so it was a blessing of an episode. Uh, if you don't know who John is, he is an international um, speaker, leader, author, um, he speaks to NFL teams, to high schools and churches. He is uh, a leader for sure in all different domains. And so, Charlie, do you want to touch a little bit about um, your favorite parts of the episode? Well, yeah, one of the things John Gordon is known for is like team leadership and positivity, which are all great. And we do touch on those. But in this episode, it's unique because we really get to tie into who is John Gordon as a Christian. And I love that he talks about his faith and specifically this one word that he kind of brings up, abide, abiding in Jesus. And so it's a really cool episode. I really think you guys are going to get a lot out of it. John, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, great to be with you guys. So John, I would be absolutely shocked if anyone in our profession did not know who you are. Um, but for anyone who doesn't, for anybody who's not familiar with John Gordon, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to the current role where you are today? Well, that's a long story, but yeah. I st started out, hey, straight out of Smithtown, you know, grew up there, played lacrosse at Cornell University, experience, I mean, had a huge impact on me, changed my life, graduate college, moved down to Atlanta, meet my wife at 24 years old. I had just opened up a bar in Buckhead. And so I meet her. It was a love at first sight for her. It took a while, but fell in love. She finally agreed to go out with me. We eventually got married. We had two small children. And I went to go work for a dot com. I had a couple of restaurants. I ran for city council, lost the election, did a lot of different things, went to law school for a year and a half, said, this is not for me. And then I go work for this dot com to try to make my gazillions of dollars, had a lot of shares and that fails. That company crumbles and basically I lose everything. My world comes crumbling down. I am fearful and stressed and anxious. I'm not a good husband. I'm not a good dad. We had two small children and she almost left me. And she said, if you don't change, like I'm out of here. She was ready to leave and I had to change. So I begged her to stay. I agreed to change. And that began this journey of, of doing this work and becoming a more positive person. It was during that time I said, what am I born to do? Why am I here? And writing and speaking just kept on coming to me. I didn't know what I was going to write and speak about. I just knew that I wanted to do this and, and impact others. And from there, I started a newsletter five subscribers to my newsletter, my mother, my brother, my best friend from college. <laughs> they were getting this newsletter, whether they liked it or not. And I started sharing these tips every week and people started to read it and start to share it. And that started to have me do this work. And I was learning myself, growing, writing about what I was learning about, sharing it with others. And next thing you know, I, I wrote the energy bus a few years later. This was in 2006. I'm about 35 years old. And I start writing and speaking and doing this work. And now I've written 23 other books since and get to speak to a lot of organizations, teams, pro teams, college teams, uh, Fortune 500 companies, a lot of school districts. And as you know, I just love doing this work. Love, uh, love talking about leadership, culture, teamwork, performance, right? It's all about ultimately being our best. And I have a you know, a, a faith part of me as well that that drives me to be the best I can be. I came to faith at, when I was 35 years old. Around that same time, I wrote the energy bus and that changed everything for me. Yeah, the energy bus is an amazing book. I mean, that was my first introduction to John Gordon, Positivity. So definitely recommend that book to anybody who has not read it. The energy bus is a phenomenal read. But, but just talking about your inspiration. So 
I mean, you're kind of known as like the positivity guy and leadership guy. What specifically drew you to those two topics? You could have talked about anything. You could have had a different path. What specifically in your journey inspired you and led you to those two topics and, and other things as well? Well, I believe it was my calling. I was meant to talk about these. It wasn't really even a choice. Like this was something I wanted to be more of. I, I wanted to be positive and I wasn't and I mm -hmm. needed to be. So I started talking about that. And then the more I talked about it, I got energized by it. Early on, I enjoyed talking about health and wellness and I would bring that into my talks. But when I did, I wasn't as energized mm -hmm. as when I talked about the mental state, when I talked about the mindset, when I talked about feeding the positive, overcoming negativity, how to turn challenges into opportunities. And then from there, I started speaking a lot about positivity. And then that grew into positive leadership that I was working with all these companies now seeing that there was a void in leadership, knowing that great leaders build great cultures. Mm -hmm. And if I just went in and talked about positivity, it doesn't help if the leader's not positive. It doesn't help if the leader doesn't lead a certain way that gets buy-in from the team that builds a great organization, that builds a great team, that builds a great culture. So I really started to move towards leadership. And again, I would say I was called to do it because it's what I'm known for now, positive leadership and building positive teams. And I see the progression, how I went from positivity to leadership, and then the, co the combination of the two to bring them together and share them in a way that helps people understand what makes great leaders great. Alan Mulally, when he turned around Ford in 2006, during the Great Recession, they were losing $14 billion. He takes over. He turns the company around. One of the greatest leadership feats in history. And he defined his leadership style as positive leadership. And so here I was writing the book. I read that article. I reached out to him, interviewed him for the book, and, and then never looked back knowing that this is my work that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Unbelievable. That's awesome. And one thing that stands out to me there, John, is when you got aligned with your purpose and things that you're passionate about, you you excelled in that area and God had a path for you and a plan for you. And it's almost like you just kind of stepped into it. It was where you were gifted, but then you honed your craft and you grew in that area. And um, I think anytime we're talking about things that we're passionate about, you know, it's always going to come out more genuine and uh, we're going to enjoy ourselves more. And so um, I know another thing, like you said, you're passionate about briefly earlier is your relationship with God. And so I just love to hear a little bit about how did you get passionate? about Jesus and why is he so important to you? Well, you have to know like your sweet spot for the first part of your question. Mm. It's like, where are your strengths? What do you love to do? Because you can be strong at something, but you're not passionate and you don't love it. So if you're really not loving what you do, even though you're good at it, you probably don't want to do that. I was good at the restaurant business. I own several Moe's Southwest Grill franchises. And I asked myself, do I want 20 of these? Do I see myself having 50 of them 10 years from now where I'm a major restaurant owner? Will I be happy with my life running a restaurant company? And the answer was no. I knew that I was good at it, but it wasn't for me. So what are you passionate about? What do you love to do? What are your strengths? What will you do where you're not getting paid for it? Like that was my focus. And I yeah. said, you know what? I want to do this work. I want to write and speak. So I knew this was for me. From a faith standpoint, I was struggling in so many ways for, for, for so long. And a friend introduced me to some sermons by Erwin McManus. And one was called why I follow Jesus. And I listened to the sermon and it really spoke to me. Now, both my biological parents were Jewish. My mom was Jewish, but here I am now listening to a sermon about Jesus. And it really is speaking to me in terms of Jesus as a, a, a Jewish rabbi, Jesus, who was Jewish, Jesus, who, who came out of, out of that heritage. And, what he said and what he came to do. And I truly believe he came to unite man back to God, to reconcile man to God, to create the oneness that we are meant to have. Whereas we often feel separate and the word anxious, you know, literally means divided it's Greek root word. And so when you're anxious, you feel divided, you feel separate. So we know that there's this separateness. I wrote a book called the garden, which talks about the separation of man from God in the Garden of Eden, which happened. And then Jesus came to reconcile man back to God. Once you understand the story, and they're all part of the same story, one's the beginning, one's the end, it makes so much sense with our souls going through what we're going through. And everyone talks about anxiety and fear and stress and this spiritual battle that's going on and like negative thoughts. Do your negative thoughts come from you? And people always say, yeah, they're in my head. 
my next question is really who would ever choose to have a negative thought? Mm. You never choose a negative thought. I wouldn't. And so once you understand those negative thoughts are not coming from you because you wouldn't choose them, where like when you are dreaming and having a nightmare, are you choosing those thoughts? No, no one has ever found a thought instead of a brain. Thoughts are from consciousness. They come from a spiritual place. Once you understand that, you can start to see, oh, there's more to this. There is a spiritual battle. It's not about man-made strategies. You'll never win a spiritual battle with man-made strategies. You have to understand it's a spiritual battle and you have to win the spiritual battle with a greater strength, a greater source, with supernatural power. And that's God. And for me, that's Jesus. And so that's what changed my life. And once I came to, to believe that and receive that, everything in my life changed. I'm not here to tell people what to believe or convince them of that. I just know for me, when I gave my life to Jesus and I accepted him as my savior, I was reconciled back to the creator of the universe in that oneness, which is the ultimate plan. And then from there, I had more strength, more wisdom, more peace, more joy, more love in my heart, not judgment. If you see Christians as that way, that's not a real Christian. We're not called to judge, but called to love and called to share that. And that's how I try to live my life. I wrote The Carpenter, which is about love, serving, and caring. And those are the three greatest success principles of all. And that's how Jesus led, love, serving, care. So I'm just passionate about Jesus. I'm passionate about God. I'm passionate about, you know, knowing that there's a creator of the universe and that creator cares about my life, cares about your life, that we're all children of God. And knowing that, that drives me to do what I do. Now, when I speak to a company, do I, do I share this? Not all the time, no. When I speak to a sports team, do I share it? Not necessarily because... I have to respect where the coach is, where the team is, but I will share my essence of who I am and my faith comes through. It drives me to do what I do to make a greater impact. And I can help that team perform at a higher level as a result of the energy I bring to that team. And so most organizations are, are okay with me knowing that I'm a person of faith. They're okay with me coming in, right? And wanting to make a difference because they know it's going to benefit their people. But it's my faith that drives me and people should know that. And I'm not shy about it. If someone asks me, I'm going to tell them. But I also know that I don't have to be doing an altar call at every talk, right? But, but I do know that Jesus is my strength and I know that I am who I am because of that relationship. Yeah, man, so many good things I could comment on right there. John, I just really appreciate your vulnerability and openness in that. And, you know, maybe something our listeners probably would love to hear too is, you know, you're the positivity guy, but what do you do when, when life isn't positive? Have you had any really hard trials that you would be willing to share with us and, and how Jesus, not just positivity, but how Jesus in your life has really helped you overcome that? Well, my faith in God doesn't make life easier. It makes me stronger. Amen. And Amen. it doesn't mean you're not going to face challenges. You're going to have setbacks you're gonna have obstacles it's not like oh i have this faith and everything is is great <laughs> on my own i am fearful with god i am faithful and so wow. in that yeah. faith i find a greater strength and any addiction program actually believes in a higher power why because these addiction programs know and it's a universal truth that we are not strong enough on our own our will is not strong enough. We need a greater strength. We need a greater power to tap into. Mm -hmm. And so God is that greater power. And I believe that Jesus is the one who, again, it's the Trinity, right? People don't always, under, it's always confusing. Yeah. It can be confusing, hard to understand, but yeah. Jesus is sort of the connection point between man and God. So that's the way I look at it. And for me, when I've had hard times, it's my faith that has carried me. When I, you know, when my wife almost left me, it led me to my faith. When my mom died, when my dad died, right? My faith allows me to move through those challenging times and those struggles. When I have challenges along the way, like COVID, for instance, when it hit and everything was being canceled and all my speed engagements were being canceled and we didn't know what the future held, I relied on my faith. My faith grew so much stronger during this time because I saw how my complete trust gave me peace. I saw God working in my life. I saw amazing things happen as a result of this amidst all the pain and the struggle and all the bad stuff that happened. I saw so many miracles and so many amazing things by just trusting in God. I saw what happened as a result of that. So my faith actually even grew. So through all the hard times in my life, my faith has actually grown stronger as a result of having to trust in and rely on not myself, 
but on God. It's almost like the trials show your faith. The trials give you the opportunity to really have that faith in there. And, and for us too, remembering that, like, I love what you said, we ultimately too are saved by grace through faith in Jesus. It's like, we, you're right, we cannot get to God. And so we need that mediator. We need God to come to us through Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit empowers us to live this life. So yeah, I thought that was really well said. I, I appreciate that. And I also, I know that when people are struggling in those moments, what do you turn to? Who do you turn to in those moments? If you're just relying on yourself and yourself isn't strong enough, what do you do then? I think many of us have had a moment where we knew that God carried us. We knew that God showed us the way. So often we're like, God, show me and I'll trust you. And God says, trust me and I'll show you. And so in those moments of trust and surrender, God does carry us. He does show us the way. That's why I meet so many athletes who are faithful people. Why? Because these athletes have come to a point where they're injured, where they were struggling, where they come to the end of themselves. And then they realize, wow, this God, something carried me. Something pushed me over the line, mm -hmm. brought me forward, lifted me up when I was down. There was a greater strength. There was a greater power. And in that moment, they recognize it was God. It wasn't them. And that's why they have so much faith in their lives. Because people always ask, like, why, are there, why is there so much faith in sports? And these guys are always talking about God when they win a game. Why do they got to talk about God? Because they know they didn't do it on their own. <laughs> Same thing with me as a writer, as a speaker, as an athlete. There were so many times where the energy bus was rejected by over 30 publishers, right? Wow. Where you're ready to give up and you don't give up. And somehow, some way you see God's miracle, get this book published, eventually selling 2 million copies, impacting lives, transforming souls, and helping people not to kill themselves. I've gotten emails where people said, I was going to kill myself. I read your book and I didn't. And you knew that that's why God had you write the book. It wasn't even about you. It was about that person who you're going to save their life. And you see God working and you see the miracles. I think miracles are always happening. People just don't look at them. People mm. don't trust. They don't believe. They don't have eyes to see. So they're missing all the, all the miracles and amazing things around them. You're living on a rock that is traveling through outer space, 60,000 <laughs> miles an hour, Amen. spinning 1,000 miles an hour. And you're trying to be logical about your existence. <laughs> we are spinning right now and traveling 60,000 oh, miles per hour around a great ball of fire called the sun that is giving us life. And we think that, oh, well, you know, there's no possibility of a God. Are you kidding? Look at our existence. <laughs> wow. So true. Amen. It's awesome. Um, I think we could like, I feel like you could preach a sermon, John, if you really wanted to. I know, man. <laughs> Let him go. Let him go. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, I, it's funny. I did the power of a positive team the other day at a church, a talk I give to a lot of teams, organizations in a very secular way. But then yeah. I was in a church and I did it as a church. And it was really fun to deliver it in a church format, talking about even the Trinity yeah. is a team, the Father, the Son, and the Holy yeah. Spirit. Wow. We were all made for relationships. So even the essence of life, the Trinity, is a relationship. And we were made for relationship, one with God and one with each other. And what does the enemy want to do? The devil wants to separate us from God, our relationship with God, and separate us from each other. Mm -hmm. What is happening right now on Isolation. this planet, in this country? The wow. enemy is doing a great job separating us from each other dividing and separating and dividing people from God. But a lot of people are also coming to God because they're finding they need something greater in this moment. They've come to the end of their themselves. They're facing anxiety and stress and fear. They've had enough. And they're like, help me. And that was me. I cried out. Sometimes we just have to be desperate enough to believe. And I just finally cried out. I finally let go of my own ego. I finally mm -hmm. said, I can't do it alone. And it was in that moment where I finally said, all right, God, I believe, I trust. And that's when everything changed for me. So I was like a lot of people holding on, being resistant. When I finally said, all right, I trust, I believe. That's when God said, all right, I got this. And I, he started working in my life. And I, when I remember when I was, I was like, all right, I'm going to give this Jesus a shot after yeah. finally just saying, I'm going to trust. I didn't have all the answers. I didn't fully, fully, fully believe. So I had a prayer, God, strengthen my faith. Like this doesn't seem real at times, but strengthen my faith and show me that this is real. And sure mm -hmm. enough, God kept showing me one situation after other that was real. And mm -hmm. sometimes I question like, do I really believe this? Because for so long I didn't. 
but I can't discount how God has changed my heart and how my faith in Jesus has changed me. I realize I need a savior because I couldn't save myself. Mm. And once you recognize that, that's the beginning of you finding a greater power to live in this power and truth for the plan that God has for you and for the life that he has created you for. And that's where the power is. So you can resist, you can resist, but you'll <laughs> never fully live the life that God has for you. John, it's awesome that you've written so many books because your life seems like you've just learned lesson after lesson and we're blessed that we can read it in the pages of your books. And so, um, you know, if you can go back to an earlier, younger John Gordon, um, early in your faith walk, early in your life, I mean, what are some of the things you wish you would have knew then that you know now? Stop trying to be perfect. You're not. I would tell myself, you'll find her. The right woman is, is out there for you. So don't worry about that. You'll find her in the right time, in the right moment, in the right place. I would tell myself, don't tie your performance to your identity. What you do is not who you are and never allow the outcome or your performance to, to determine how you feel about yourself. Because as a former athlete, you know, who played lacrosse at Cornell, I always had this desire to be perfect never wanted to mess up. Mm -hmm. I never fully enjoyed the games I played because I was always worried about messing up. I always had this fear of not performing to a higher level. And I was always worried about the outcome. So I never enjoyed the moment of just playing and competing. I never played free. So if I can go back and do it again, I would have just given everything I had in the moment. I would have loved the opportunity to compete. I would have loved playing the game that I, that I fell in love with and played with that childlike spirit instead of worrying so much. And I see, I see too many young athletes, fear, stress, anxiety, performance, uh, social media, yeah. everything is causing them to look outside, right? They're causing them to look outside and to outcomes instead of inside into the soul of who they are. Yeah, man, that is, that is so good because I feel like so many times we forget the things that we've learned. And so being able to step back and say, if I could go back and talk to myself. So my final question for you, John, is if you could go back and, and talk to coaches now that are listening to this podcast, I mean, we have a lot of young strength coaches, a lot of young um, Christians that are new in the faith. Maybe they just became a believer during this COVID pandemic season. What would be your best advice for those that are wanting to grow in their faith? Working with Dabo Sweeney all these years for the past nine years at Clemson football, it would be love tough, not tough love. So when you are coaching, love must come first. And when they know you love them, you earn the right to challenge them and push them. You've got to show them what love really looks like. If you are always driving them and not loving them, you'll burn them out and they will tune you out, right? So it's the love and accountability together is how you need to lead and coach others. I would also tell you to feed yourself each day mm -hmm. so that way you can feed others. The more you read, the more you pray, the more you, you focus on your own spiritual journey, inside you, that's what changes. Right? Yeah. Who you are on the inside determines how you lead. Mm -hmm. And as you develop that spiritual maturity on the inside, it'll, it gives you more power and strength, real power and strength to impact others outside you. So you have a greater impact on the lives of others by you feeding yourself so that way you can feed others. And if you don't have it, you can't share it. So it's about feeding yourself each day so that way you can feed others. And the best advice I ever heard is from Dr. James Gills, the only person on the planet to complete six double Ironman triathlons. That's a double Ironman, which means you do an Ironman, a day later do another one. And the last time he did it, he was 59 years old and he was asked how he did it. He said this, I've learned to talk to myself instead of listen to myself. He said, if I listen, I would, hear, I, I would hear all the fear, the negativity, the noise, you know, all the reasons why I can't finish this race. But if I talk to myself, I could feed myself with the words and the encouragement that I need to keep on moving forward. And I believe that everyone would agree that we need to stop listening to those negative voices that are not coming from us and speak words of encouragement and truth to those lies. The enemy is lying to us. He's known as the father of lies, right? Don't believe the lies speak truth to the lies. And the truth is there is greatness inside of you. The truth is God made you to do great things. Jesus said, even greater things than I shall you do. You were never meant to be average. We were made in his likeness and image, yeah. which is greatness. So once you understand that he put greatness within you to do great things, you know that he has a plan for you and he gave you the power to do it. 
problem is those voices come in that say, you're not great. You're not enough. They accuse you, right? They attack you. And what happens is when we have, when we feel unworthy, when we feel like we're not enough, pride then sets in and pride sets in because we have to fill ourselves up. We have to prop ourselves up, but pride is just the result of us trying to compensate for the unworthiness. The key is not pride because pride edges out the ego, right? And I mean, I started edges out God. It is the ego that edges God out, right? So ego edging God out. So it, pride keeps right. God away. The key is not to become prideful. The key is to realize that I'm not going to listen to these negative voices that say I'm not enough. I'm going to listen to God that knows I am enough, that created me to do great things. And it's the trust in that. So that's what I would tell. I would tell coaches to speak truth to the people they're leading, to know the truth, to speak it, to encourage them, to speak life to them, and to believe in them more than they believe in themselves, knowing that every day it's that battle between the negative voices, what they hear, and what God says. And the more you study scripture, what you recognize is what God's always saying about us. You are wonderfully made. You are beloved. Mm -hmm. You are loved. That you are a mighty warrior. That you are here to do great things. You're, you know, again, God is always speaking life, encouraging. God never puts us down. He never sabotages. He never says, you can't do this, right? God speaks truth. He speaks life and he encourages. So that's what I would tell people. I would say, just understand that, learn that. And I see the greatest coaches in the world and they're the ones who are always speaking life, encouraging and lifting up. There's enough negativity in the world that's trying to bring us down. We need more encouragers, encouragers who lift us up. But we have to challenge too, because if you love someone, yeah. you're not going to let them settle for anything but their but their best. So hey, I love you, but you're not giving your all. You're not reaching your potential. Amen. I see yeah. this in you. This is what's possible for you. Call them up to greatness instead of calling them out. Don't call them out. Call them up to greatness. I love that, uh, John. So we finish every episode with three questions. We call them fast finishers. And one of them is your favorite Bible verse. So uh, I don't know, John, if you have a favorite book um, uh, on your mind right now, favorite book, favorite Bible verse, and then how do you define success? Matthew 6.33, seek the kingdom first and all will be given to you. I love that one because it's like seek God first, not earthly things. I also love John 15. My word this year is abide. And I, I just love the the illustration of, you know, the branch and, you know, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And the idea is that we have to mm. remain in God. We have to remain in that spirit. And from that, we produce the amazing fruit in our life. But separate from that, trying to do it separate, it's not going to work. So I just love that. So those, I guess, would I would say are my favorite verses. Awesome. And then last question, how do you, John Gordon, how do you define success? Dr. David Jeremiah, I read his book recently called Forward, and he says, success is the fulfillment of God's plan for your life. I read that recently, and that's my new definition of success. Success is, is the fulfillment of God's plan for your life. Did you fulfill the plan that God had for you? It's not about making gazillions of dollars. It's not about winning a championship or a hall of fame. Did you fulfill the plan that God had? And if you do that, you're going to fulfill and, and have a feel fulfilled and have a great life. That is the key. I want to encourage everyone to read The Garden. Uh, that's a book I wrote recently. I think it will speak to you in terms of the spiritual battle we face and the plan that God has for you and how to listen and be obedient to that plan so that you can be all that God created you to be. I want people to definitely read The Garden and it will also help you with your athletes that you're coaching to help them be their best because you'll be able to help them tell a better story in the narrative that they tell themselves. And that is so great, John. And for some of the listeners, if they wanted to reach out to you, how could they connect with you? They can go to johngordon.com, J-O-N-Gordon.com or social media, Instagram, Twitter at J-O-N-Gordon11, at J-O-N-Gordon11. And so I'm always checking you know, information on there. They can DM me on that. I hear from people a lot on Twitter and, um, and it's Instagram mostly on the DM side of things. Awesome. Well, hey, John, thank you so much for being on the episode. We like to close our episodes here at Built the Last with praying for our guest. So would you be cool if we prayed for you real quick? Man, sounds good to me. I, I could use it. Awesome. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time with John Gordon and just uh, him being open and willing to share his faith journey, Lord. Uh, so many people know him for positivity and leadership. And so I just thank you, God, for allowing him to share about you, Jesus, and his passion 
um, to, to make you known and to love you with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray that you'd bless him with his children and his, his role as a father, his role as a husband, a speaker, a writer, a leader. God, I pray that you continue to bring him favor. And may you, Lord, may you help him to abide in you this year. Apart from you, God, he can do nothing. So I pray that John Gordon will remain faithful to the mission that he has put on his life from you, God. Again, we thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I appreciate you guys. And I do want to say this on positivity. You're right. I recognize at one point that when you're trying to be just positive on your own, you fall short. So your positivity is only as good as you are. And if you fall short, well, then positivity will fall short. Mm -hmm. But if your positivity is rooted in a greater power and a greater strength beyond you, which in Jesus, yeah. that is true positivity. That is real optimism. And it's biblical optimism supported by strength yeah. and truth and faith and stories that we've seen throughout history that this is not something that's fake. This is something that's real, but it only happens when you're, again, when you're rooted, right? And mm -hmm. you're connected to that greater strength, that greater source, when you're created to the root and to the vine, right? And so when you're connected yeah. there, that's how real positivity flows. Man. In the root, if you want the fruit, that's it. <laughs> I couldn't Invest say better, in the John. root, that's if you awesome. want the fruit, you know it. <laughs> hey, thanks guys. Keep up the great work you're doing. Love it. Yeah, thanks, be John. blessed. We'll talk later. Thank you for listening to the Built to Last podcast, where we encourage, equip, and empower coaches to live out their core values where they live, work, and wherever they build relationships. Have a blessed day, striving to build lasting impact.